Hello and welcome to the arbitration conversation. So in the arbitration conversation, we've now reached 51 webisodes and this is 52. So it's been going on for some time and some of the issues we've been thinking about are, you know, sort of a lot of the face to face arbitration issues, but also online arbitration or OARB, if you will. And in this webisode, we're going to discuss further how algorithms and AI can actually be part of an OARB process. So this is going to be a lot of fun to really think about how technology is revolutionizing arbitration. And for that, I have somebody who has been a revolutionary person in the area of ODR. Um, I've had the pleasure of knowing Graham Ross for a long, long time um, because of his leadership in the area of online dispute resolution. Um, Graham Ross, he's the founder and president of the Mediation Room. He's a UK lawyer and mediator with over 20, 25 years experience, I'm sure by now, in IT and the law. He's an author of legal application software, um, and he has also been involved in some very really interesting work with Smart Subtle, which we're going to talk about in a minute. So first of all, I just want to thank you, Graham, for taking time. Oh, my pleasure, Amy, and thank you for inviting me. So first of all, I always think it's really interesting to find out how somebody gets involved in law and technology. So what was your journey? What got you involved in ODR in the first place? Oh, I just loved gadgets ever since I was a child. And um, but very early on, since I qualified as a lawyer, um, I remember um, getting interested in something called Prestel, which was predates this is the dark ages before there was anything like the internet around. And you just had little work text in green that you'd display on your television if you had the right connections. <laughs> and uh, I know I used to, uh, well, I thought at that time when they were looking at a different application, wouldn't it be useful just to have some update service for lawyers instead of having to wait for magazines and papers to come out and journals telling you about latest decisions, um, that it, you could have something that just gave you a quick heads up. And so I did form something originally called Lextel, then became Lawtel. And it, uh, uh, although I, uh, at an early stage, uh, fell out with who then became my business partner, and learned a lot of experience of inter -comp or companies disputes between the owners of the company because we, we we'd done that together that probably fired my choice of subject for mediation which is that i specialize in disputes between shareholders stockholders in private companies <laughs> but anyway so that then carried on although i sold out fairly early i'm pleased to say that this is part of the thompson racers stable now called lawtel.com so that was that was my first interest then very early on just about the turn of the century um that um a friend of mine another lawyer and we had been talking about um what was then the growing new internet and opportunities there. And uh, in fact, um, we started something called We Can Settle, which was the very first blind bidding system. This was at a time when uh, Cyber Circle had been formed and a lot of other companies started out, Click and Settle, um, uh, it was one in America, I can remember, Intersettle, a Scottish company. And we did We Can Settle. And they were all variants of blind bidding, which I felt, what a wonderful idea. What a wonderful way to speed up settlement on a, on a number, on a figure. Right. And, well, and for and those that haven't, don't, could you explain just sort of, because not everybody who are, is watching this might understand exactly how blind bidding works when yeah, you're blind using... Blind bidding simply gets over that problem that when you're negotiating, whether it's to buy something or in, in the case that we're talking about, to settle a, a legal claim, um, 
People make offers. This is my final offer. I'm not going to pay them any more, any more. Your case sucks and what have you. And if that's not accepted, uh, I don't immediately come back and say, OK, I didn't mean that. I'll offer you a little bit more. No, you sit on offers and counter offers. And there's the whole psychology of it that you like to convince yourself as a lawyer is a very special skill, but it's something anybody can do. But there's this, what we call the tedious negotiation dance. What smart, what blind bidding does, and smart settle one, which perhaps I'll talk about, um, is avoid all that having to sit on your thing. You know, you don't go back with a higher offer straight away because that sends the wrong message to the other party. Um, so what you do is you can make, it's called visible blind bidding, uh, seems like contradiction, but it's that part of it is where you make open offers and you also make uh, hidden offers that the other party doesn't see. And you think, well, why would you make an offer that the other party doesn't know about? Well, of course, the, you tell the computer that this is what you're prepared to go to if the other person would. And that enables you to, to make um, more active, more dynamic negotiation. Of course, if at any stage the hidden bids uh, meet or overlap or come very close to, I can explain about the various rules you can set up, then it will announce a settlement which by pre-agreement uh, you may have decided to be bound by. And what that is doing is massively speeding up negotiation. There is a particular value for organizations handling large volumes, particularly insurance companies, uh, being that uh, we know with an insurance company faced with maybe an insured who's clearly liable, let's say a road accident, their insured drove out of a side road. Uh, there's no question about who's liable. It's just how much money to pay and what's acceptable. In cases like that, if the case is not settled soon, it may eventually drift into court. And what's going to happen whilst the insurer may um, settle eventually at a fair, correct figure that they're happy with, they will have accumulated an awful lot of legal costs. And um, by and large, although it's changing in, in England and Wales, um, costs do still to a degree follow the event and the, the person who, who loses and pays has to pay the legal costs of the other party. Um, so it makes sense, actually, for an insurer in a situation like this, where there's no dispute in Lapley, to try and offer perhaps an, a more attractive offer early in the hope that you can settle it without the legal costs. But of course, they don't do that, because if they open with a, a rather highish offer, the other side's are oh, going to have a good time here. They seem to have overvalued this case. And if it doesn't settle, um, the insurer can't uh, credibly come back and say, oh, we're now reducing our offer because the complainants will say, oh, no, we know you were prepared to go. So they don't do that. But with blind bidding, they can do that. Certainly with Smart Settle One, you can reverse your bidding. If you make a, a high offer early, it's not accepted. You can then reduce your secret bid and open bid and then negotiate a more proper or fair value, but at least you have the opportunity of settling for that. I hope that explains right. it. Yeah, and, and I definitely see the value. I mean, obviously we talk about the time value of money and time certainly is very important, especially if you're talking about an insurance company. Um, and let's kind of hone in and go a little bit kind of deep dive into Smart Subtle One. Um, because you just posted, by the way, and for those um, watching this, um, there is a new blog post on arbitrate.com by Graham Ross with respect to one and how it works. But I would love for you to explain, because I think this is really interesting from an arbitration standpoint, because when individuals agree to this contract, essentially, they agree to certain rules around the blind bidding. And perhaps you could explain that because it's really interesting, especially the algorithms and how they come into play. Yes. Yes. So what it's trying to do is encourage people to make bids, make them speedily and try to reach it. And so there are certain rules that will result in whether or not there is an agreement. Now, let's supposing the um, bids overlap. Uh, one, the payer says, I'll pay $10,000 and the the claimant says, oh, I'm happy to accept 8,000. Um, 
And um, that means there's a range there. Uh, any figure within that range is acceptable to each party. Uh, anything between 8,000 and 10,000 is acceptable to the insurer because they were prepared to pay 10. Uh, and the claimant was prepared to go down to eight, but obviously he'd be happy with anything in there because it's either eight, what he was prepared to accept, or something a little bit higher. So how does the system decide what figure within that range? And this is where the sort of e-arbitration comes into it because the, the machine, um, faced with certain knowledge it's learned of the way in which the parties negotiated and driven, is most important, driven by a desire as it was programmed to reward the party that made more effort to settle the case. So the whole system is designed to encourage people not to hold back and not make decent moves, but encourage the party to try really hard to settle it. So that the system rewards and will actually not split the difference. Mm -hmm. uh, between eight and 10, it could say, all right, you settle it at nine, it's agreed at nine. Uh, that would, first of all, it would make the last offer of the opponent transparent when it was supposed to be secret, because you just had to double the gap between your last offer and the settlement as announced, uh, if it just put it at the halfway. What it does is it works out who has made more attempt to settle and give a little bit more or charge a little, or put the figure a little bit less in the case of insurer, the payer. Uh, and it does that by an algorithm which basically one can say it's within that zone, which party had to make the smaller last move of his secret bid to get into that zone between eight and 10. Because obviously that person had been there and tried to move closer or quickly. So in other words, it doesn't want to reward parties for re holding back, which if it was a split the difference, it would. So that's a form of electronic arbitration, but the rules, the algorithms are quite transparent. Smart Settle put those up on their website. They've always been transparent. They have, I think, about eight different algorithms. Knowing how they operate um, adds value and encourages the parties in their bidding. If, in fact, the, the, a similar thing happens if the final bids don't quite meet. So I explained that where they overlap. If they don't quite meet, um, every time you make a bid, you're invited to say, look, if it reaches a settlement, would you be prepared to go just a little bit further? So the parties enter that. And in situations where those little bit furthers uh, meet, there's still a, a formal gap between the last offers. That gap is also resolved in the same way as the overlap. So the same algorithm applies. Yeah, well, it's interesting um, just for students also who we, we talk often about the zone of potential agreement. And what's interesting is this is a direct way to deal with where there is a zone of potential agreement, but also where there's not a zone of potential agreement to perhaps use a bit of e-nudging to get the individuals toward a zone of potential agreement. Yeah, uh, e-nudging, I love that. And uh, <laughs> the, in fact, if there is no um, if if there is no agreement, both parties have the option of bringing in another process called the end process. Very convenient acronym there, which is expert neutral decider or determinator, whatever. And <laughs> what it then does, it then, and this is entirely optional. So if the system doesn't produce a settlement under the algorithms I've mentioned, um, overlap will come close and within the authority of extension. That's a point to make. Every agreement reached under Smart Settle One is within the desired bidding of each party. This is not the robot making the decision 
again with and, and, you know against the wishes of the parties. I was very annoyed when I used this in a court case last year, and I've got a lot of publicity around the world. Many of the headlines talked about the robot mediator. It is not the robot mediator. It's a machine no. very clever. But in the end process, you have three uh, things called human beings, and these are live on it. And we ask these human beings, um, sorry, the computer couldn't do it. We need you guys and guys to come in and see what you can do. They each look at all the documents and the information that is made available to them, not as in depth as you would get in a true arbitration, it has to be said. And they're asked to, to set what they consider would be the fur settlement. And agreeing there's going to be a payment, what would be a fair amount? There are three amounts. Um, the, 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 the party who's made a bid closest to the middle one, it is then settled at that middle one. So of the three, whichever figure is in the middle, they then make uh, uh, the party who's nearest to it um, is in fact a big one is in fact awarded on his offer. I should add, not the not the mm -hmm. uh, amount assessed, but whosoever's last bid was closest to it. That's the way it works. That's made clear to people before they're entered into the system, um, and and in a sense, it's one way of creating some definitive finality out of it. Yeah, I think this is actually really really interesting because it's a creative use of technology for a lot of different purposes. I mean, I really see the functional analysis here because also what we're talking about are post dispute agreements to allow for use of the process, which also gets it past a lot of the fairness concerns with pre dispute arbitration. So you're getting around those concerns and focusing on how we can create a fast and fair process, right? And so there's some efficiency and fairness issues that you're balancing in a way to find optimized value. Um, I think that's really interesting, especially the um, end program bringing in um, the individuals. So are these experts, is, are they chosen by the parties or are they um, assigned? Assigned. Okay. But anybody can apply to join that, and I suppose. And I should, I should add that the post dispute agreement is not necessarily pre the use of smart settle one. So they're obviously post dispute in the sense that they could agree that before at the beginning when they start to use the system, try to settle themselves, or if it's not successful when they use it, they're then given the option. And only of course, if both of them say yes, do they bring the panel in. Exactly. Well, this is really interesting. I guess sort of as a last um, question is, where do you see the future? So where do you see the next steps for sort of the use of AI and arbitration and kind of you read now, five years from now, one year from now, what do you think the next step is? It's when we eventually get out of Zoom, it'll be to infinity and beyond, uh, <laughs> quite literally, because the, 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 the next product fully developed now by Smart Settle is infinity, which is a more is, is a case is a similar system, but for more complex um, disputes where there are a number of issues and where the settlement would not simply be a payment of X, but would be a payment of X plus on the condition that these goods are returned or extra costs are paid or any sort of uh, dispute that's got a number of factors to it that could be incorporated in a settlement that would be acceptable to both parties. I think that is really the future is where the templates, I don't have time really, I suppose, to, to, to talk about infinity at the moment, although I have just written another paper on explaining how infinity can be a great benefit to mediators. It doesn't, I mean, you might look at Smart Settle One and say, well, the parties could just have a go at that themselves. Um, uh, is this a worry to me as a mediator of my marketplace? Um, infinity is quite the opposite. It's it's not uh, not for the faint-hearted and not for the uh, not really for clients doing it on one occasion. It needs to be mediators need to be fully trained in it, and they use it as a tool. You know, like you might use spreadsheets to work out damages or calculate. Oh. 
We'll definitely have to have a part two of our conversation to focus on infinity and beyond. <laughs> Graham, There's thank you so much for taking the time. This is really interesting, really interesting stuff. Thank you very much for inviting me.